Hello, everyone, and welcome back to uh, part two of my interview with Andrew and Allison Jolly. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who haven't joined us yet for the first half, it is a really, really epic, mind-blowing interview about how Andrew and Allison Jolly were raised in the church but, but had some deep uh, you know, difficulties and challenges with how they experienced Mormonism. Andrew with a lot of sexual shame and guilt and public shaming. Allison, as she struggled with depression on her mission um, and how she coped with it and just kind of stuffing it and trying to just soldier on, they brought some of that damage and, and difficulty and trauma into their marriage. And as their marriage progressed, Andrew got more and more focused on work, uh, more and more keeping things to himself. Allison became more focused on the family and the children and the church. And we just saw their marriage kind of really fork and separate um, to the point where the marriage kind of reached a real state of peril. Andrew uh, decided that he was going to really do a lot of self-discovery and try and uh, heal and grow, but that involved really digging into Mormonism and trying to understand it more. And that ultimately led him to sort of lose his belief in Mormonism and criticize the church to Allison, which made things even more complicated because then Allison was holding on to the church even more as, as sort of a backfire effect, reacting to the criticism. And this is just driving this massive wedge between them. So uh, that's where we are in the epic journey. This part three is going to be how their marriage got better um, and how they healed it, which I think we're all on the edges of our seats to hear how you did that. We'll cover that. And then at some point, Allison may book and we will end with coming to understand how in the heck does this Mormon couple where they'd served in callings, he was AP on his mission. I'm sure she had Relief Society here in women's callings. How do they become the owners of, of one of the major companies in Nevada um, growing and dispensing marijuana or cannabis uh, to the public? How does that happen? Um, but this uh, marriage and faith journey in and of itself deserves its own um, its own treatment. So thanks to everyone who's been joining us on Facebook Live. We've had a great audience so far. Please like us. Please like the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page. Please share it. Please give us a positive review. Please go to your wall right now and say, hey, there's this epic, amazing interview going on about healthy marriages and a faith crisis and then medical marijuana. Please share it on your walls so that other people can uh, know about it and we can have a big live audience. We do want to take your questions and comments so please keep sharing them. And, um, and again, it's April 17, 2018. We're broadcasting live from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And we're here with Andrew and Allison Jol Jolly. So guys, welcome back to part Thanks, three John. of your interview. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah. Are you tired yet? Actually, very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this has been a lot harder than I thought. <laughs> well, good. Well, um, so we're all on the edge of our seats. We're trying to figure out how in the heck you were, you saved this marriage, this marriage. Would you say it was in a very perilous state? Absolutely. I think that's being generous. <laughs> Give us some adjectives to describe the state of the marriage when it was at its worst. Um, we just literally could not, we could not get on the same wavelength. We could not connect at all. And the, issues were just bubbling up like we couldn't go 24 hours without towards the end without something kind of surfacing and we just couldn't talk about anything because everything had gotten so heated um that it got uh it got pretty intense there towards the end hopeless gridlock yeah. um despair sadness remorse frustration um, a real just, deep sense of confusion too. How do we get out of this yeah, mess? So confusing. So how, what were the steps towards healing your marriage? I, I get a sense you guys are healthy and happy now mm -hmm. and you've been able to sustain that for months, if not more. Yeah. Talk yeah. us through the steps of healing your marriage. How did you do it? Allison, you start. You know what? I think, um, I have to say for a good year and a half to two years, we were going to therapy and working on our marriage simultaneously while all this was going on. So there was work being done. So talk about that. Right. How did you, 
How did you find a therapist? And, um, and you know, who, who, who was helpful for you in therapy and what was helpful for you in therapy? Um, you know, Andrew found the therapist. We started, we tried a few different ones, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but we found one that was a good fit. She was fantastic. Um, she was raised LDS, but had left the church, but she was so capable of relating to both of us mm -hmm. while I saw her as a fully believing, um, active member of the church. She made me feel very comfortable. She encouraged me to follow what I felt was right and true. And I didn't feel threatened by her point of view. Like she was very able to mm -hmm. manage both sides and heal us as a, help us work on healing ourselves as a couple and see things differently through different perspectives, which was really helpful. Cause I know some people who are believing feel like they have to have a therapist that's believing. And that's like a criteria that they don't want to go if, if they're not going to understand them or they're going to be skewed or I can't trust them. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that, um, that was not the case in our, um, situation. And I have to kind of give hats off to our therapist for her skillful way of handling both of us okay fairly what, what aspects of that particular therapist approach to therapy was useful to you um i don't know there just was no pressure we were able to just communicate openly in front of her and she sensed into where we were going and what we, i don't know maybe you have something to say on that well, I, I think she deprioritized the church a lot mm -hmm. in the beginning to help us recognize that there were fundamental deficiencies in our marriage that had nothing to do with the church. And starting with that as a kind of a baseline was very helpful because then we started to practice communication. We started to practice the fundamentals. We started to practice respect. We started to give each other space to express these deep, hurtful sometimes feelings that we were in, unable to express to each other alone. She provided a space for us to do that in a healthy way and to start unpacking some of the trauma, some of the sadness, some of the difficulty that we just weren't able to get out on our own. And, and I think that more than anything laid yeah. the groundwork for the work that came later, just being able to communicate and respect each other's voice. Um, Allison could hear me express my deep anger and frustration with the church without feeling attacked. And I could hear her express her loneliness and isolation without me feeling like a failure as a husband. So providing that space where we could really share without attacking each other, I think was, was critical. And it yeah. took a little bit of trial and error. It's like dating. You have to find a therapist that you really jive with and who really gets you. Um, not all therapists are created equal. And um, you know, I think there are great therapists in the church. There are great therapists out of the church. It's really finding that right kind of combination. But that was a big step in our, in kind of shedding some of our baggage and, and, and making headway. Okay, so what, what else helped? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, what you do you? have PTSD over it? I kind of do. <laughs> you know, one thing I, that I did and that we did is that I put in my calendar every Sunday night, I'd block out two hours and it just said Allison time. Yeah. And that was our time to practice what we were talking about, you know, in therapy or whatever, um, during the week that I think that was really helpful. Yeah. And it was hard. It was challenging. Um, going out on dates, you know, just spending that time with each other was, was really, really critical and important. And what I, Looking back, what it felt like was that that we both looked at each other. Instead of turning outward, her turning to the church, me turning to anger or whatever, we, we turned to each other. And that, to me, showed that, okay, we're committed to making this work. Now let's just figure out how, uh, how to make it work and how to communicate. And that felt... Um, that gave us the optimism that kind of fueled the work that we yeah. needed to do, right? I've seen cases where one spouse, when they hit something this significant, turns outside of the marriage in any shape or form, right? Whether it's turning to the church, whether it's turning to vice, whether it's turning to addiction, 
other relationships. And when one person is facing the marriage and the other person is facing externally, that's not going to work. And the, the good thing for both Allison and I was when we hit this, this kind of crisis moment, we both, we both looked at each other and said, we're going we're gonna to fight for this. We're going to try. And, and then the things just kind of fell into place as we did the work from there, if that, if that makes sense. Okay. So you're, you're seeing a therapist. Uh, you're starting to have, you have a, a therapist that's able to sort of moderate healthy conversations. You're starting to talk things out. You're starting to get closer. How are you resolving the faith differences? Mm -hmm. To me, that was much more fundamental and actually came later. Um, you kind of, in a sense, set it aside and said, do we care more about being right or about being connected? That was a huge lesson I had to learn because I was always the lawyer putting the church on trial. And she had, didn't want to be a part of that conversation. <laughs> and so, you know, when we were able to hear each other and just quiet the noise and quiet the chatter, quiet the fear, quiet everything else and really hear each other, I believe that was our first step in, in healing really truly listening and understanding each other we would do these basic exercises where it wouldn't even do it with our, our relationship it would be like i would share a concept and then she would listen without interrupting me and then she would have to repeat that concept back to me in a way that i could say that 100 percent captures the concept i was trying to communicate and then we would reverse and she would do the same thing and just that practice of actually listening to each other and actually understanding each other at a fundamental level to the point where you have to prove it back to the, the, the communicator, that was um, an exercise I remember that was actually you know, helpful, even though it seems yeah. pretty basic. <laughs> but I, uh, if I'm honest, like all these different, uh, all these things made a difference and they were setting the stage for what was to come, but I, I don't think any... I think the real breakthrough happened when I went through my crisis. I think that was like, we were at the edge, the breaking point. Like I actually remember the day we were in the kitchen, we were at a, just a complete impasse and I was dying and I, I asked him to move out. And I think that was kind of the, when it just, when it got really real and that's when everything started to shift. So what was, what were the dynamics that were making you kind of want him to move out? What, what was going on with you? How was it building? Um, what, what were you experiencing? You know, he had already resigned from the church and I was still in and I really wanted the ability. I was okay. I, I really was okay with him being out of the church. So if I was going to respect him and let him be out and not fight it, complain about it, or, or have an issue, I wanted the same respect. And I wanted to be able to go to church. I wanted to be able to fulfill my calling, have the kids go do all these things, and just have it be okay. I wanted that equal respect. And he, when he first left, he was kind of on a high, and it was okay, and he could do that. And then it got to the point where he was getting, he, I was sensing that he was getting resentful when I would go to church. He would get resentful when I was gone at night with my calling in Relief Society. Um, he'd get frustrated if I was reading my scripture sometimes. Um, I remember there were numerous times where he would struggle with, um, he'd kind of make fun of me wearing my garments and that would really hurt. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, what am I supposed to do? This means so much to me. Like, if I'm gonna respect you and be okay with you being out, mm -hmm. you have to be okay with me being in. And I felt like all of a sudden we lost that. And then when we got to that point, he's out, I'm in, he's getting upset when the kids are going to church. We, it was going to be, it was summertime. And all of a sudden we have got someone going to girls camp, someone going to scout camp, someone wanting to go on a church history tour, someone wanting to go here. And all of a sudden he's losing it. And I'm like, this is our life. This is what our kids do. This is what their friends are doing. Like, why are you having such a problem with it? Like, the reality of living a mixed faith marriage was really put to the test. And I realized like, 
I wasn't feeling the freedom to do that. And as that started to happen, I started to get even more resentful and angry. And like the mental gymnastics of how do I make this work? How can I stay in it? It got real. And I got, that's when I started to get even more like depressed, like even like physically, emotionally, like I was just in this downward spiral where I got to the point where I'm like, I don't even know if I can save this marriage. I don't know what I can do, but at this point, all I can do is save myself. Like I am drowning. I was not suicidal, but it was like, I was at the end. Like I saw no way out. It was, there was no answer. I had come up with every possible alternative in my head 10 times, you know, that hour. I mean, that was just, it was constantly, constantly going and I couldn't take it anymore. And I was just at the point of completely being able to give up and not function. And again, the hardest parts for you were what? I mean, he's, you're going through therapy, you're communicating better. Mm -hmm. He's staying home from church. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And you're taking the kids to church. What was that like for you to go to church alone and to be taking the kids to church alone? Oh, I preferred it. I was totally content doing that. I didn't like it when he went because I felt stressed. He was irritated. He'd come home in a bad mood. It actually was more stressful. I liked going to church by myself. He felt guilty and he didn't want to be that guy making his wife go to church. So he'd come with me to show support and love, but that was actually more difficult. I preferred it when he didn't go. Hmm. Okay. And so why was this mixed faith marriage weighing on you so heavily? Why were you getting more and more depressed? Because he would not let me live my faith without giving me grief over it. Okay. So he was still harassing you. The therapy wasn't stopping that. Correct. Okay. So, Andrew, you were being a jerk, man. He was trying I guess not I to was. be. I was trying hard not to be. And, and it was weird because when I look back at it, I, fe I, I actually had a different experience of what Allison described. I mean, we were working on the fundamentals of our marriage at the same time, trying to navigate this mixed faith marriage, trying to talk about raising kids. And in a lot of ways, we were communicating better. But in, in my experience, we still couldn't talk about openly, 100% openly about how we really felt without offending each other. Yeah, that makes sense. We just couldn't do it. We got better at it, but we went from a zero to a three, right? I wanted a nine or a 10. I think Allison wanted a nine or a 10. Well, we could accept the differences, but we could never see eye to eye or see mm -hmm. each other. We could not see each other or understand where each other was coming from. We fundamentally disagreed at such a deep level on these critical issues that form your whole world view. Mm -hmm. I mean, your whole world view, we had different world views. So as much as we loved each other, would treat each other nicely, would go out to dinner, you know, everything was still in every other aspect fine. When you can't have that connection and that emotional intimacy at that level, I wanted more from a marriage than that, and so did he. Some mm -hmm. people could be happy with just getting by, but we are both kind of like fighters, high expectations. We're going to live our best life. We want, we want the best of the best always, right, for mm -hmm. ourselves and for our level of happiness, and we weren't going to settle for that. And so we were just buttoned up against it because we couldn't get there. We weren't okay with status quo. We expected more than that. We wanted more than that probably a year into the mixed faith marriage after I, I mean I had stopped believing years ago I had resigned maybe a year before one night it was probably in February or so we uh, we were out to dinner we we're at sushi fever and we were talking about our summer we love to travel with our kids and and I wanted to try to plan a, a vacation with the family for the summer and so we kind of got out our calendars and started looking at and from the very beginning to the very end of summer, it was filled with church stuff. It was girls camp, it was boys camp, it was EFY, it was this conference and that conference. And, and then she had to do some, some stuff for Lucy. And I realized that I was going to miss that summer with my kids. That, that, that what I wanted was to take them somewhere beautiful in the world and just to be with them. And I wasn't gonna get that. I was going to be shuttling them to my biggest source of pain, you know, the church. And I erupted. I lost, I just lost it in the restaurant and was 
you know, just went off and I channeled so much of my anger at Allison and in that conversation. You see, this is what happens when you make the church a higher priority than your marriage and then your family. And, and it was that kind of explosive moment that I think was really pivotal because the very next morning, uh, we went home, went to bed without talking and resolving it. The very next morning is when she asked me to move out. And I think that was actually a really critical moment because I had to really look at her and go, yeah, this could be it. And what came to me was the church still isn't worth it. I'm not going to ruin my marriage. I'm not going to distance myself from my kids over the church. So I said, okay, I'm done. I'm not going to bring it up ever again. I'm done talking about the church. I'll just keep it inside and I'll deal with it how I need to deal with it in the best way I can. But I'm not going to burden you in our relationship because you don't want to hear it. And I can't apparently express it in a way that doesn't offend you. And we left, you know, that conversation. I came home from work when she asked me to leave and we had this long talk. And, <clears throat> and that's when I made the decision never to talk about the church again, at least in a, in a disparaging way. And then, and, and I'm just gonna if I can jump. I, in with I, a quick, I have to oh, go ahead. really. I'll, I just have to yeah. say like, that is accurate. But even though he would say that, I was never even. I wasn't comfortable with that because I knew, mm -hmm. I couldn't do that to him, because mm -hmm. that wasn't him, and he would never be happy. Mm -hmm. So even if we stayed married, mm -hmm. I didn't want that from him because that's not him, and he wouldn't be happy. Yeah. There was still this under, like, I couldn't be comfortable with that. It wasn't like I wanted to win this battle but, and have him just. But that's what I did. I said, it's not worth it. So I, I just dropped it. And from that point forward, we just didn't talk about the church at, other than the logistics. Oh, well, that's was, actually also when it, we called you. <laughs> it we is. had a few really key. Uh, the very day. <laughs> some very key um, that was sessions a very, very, with very, John. Yeah, important point. So. Quick coaching moment. Um, I love this. <laughs> Two things that are sticking out for me. One, I, I remember this quote from Fiddler on the Roof, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's like, a fish and a bird may love each other, but where will they build their nest, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. we, you know, Allison, you talk so beautifully about this idea of worldviews. When one person, let's just say, has a scientific empirical worldview where they care about evidence, they care about truth, in terms of learning all the history and, and basing a, a life on let's just say science and evidence and history and the best gathering of information that they can find, breaking off societal norms or parental norms or religious norms because you don't want to follow or obey anything that doesn't feel right to you, that doesn't have evidence to back it up, that doesn't seem you know, supportive of the world. That's kind of one worldview. And then another worldview, which I'm not saying is lesser than or illegitimate, it's like my parents taught me this, I believe this, I have faith in this, this makes me feel good. I've had emotional witness that this is all true. And so I don't care about that evidence or that history or science or whatever it is, I don't care. What I care about is like living this good, wholesome, committed life with this faith being integral. Like those are two really different worldviews. And it is really hard to have true emotional intimacy in that paradigm. Because Allison will say to Andrew, oh, I learned this great thing at church today. It really warmed my soul and made me feel really fulfilled and, and enlightened. Let me share it with you. Because Allison's being genuine in that moment and saying, this is what really matters to me. And Andrew's like rolling his eyes and saying, this is the stupidest, dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like, how can you relate on that level? Or what's really common on the non-believers perspective. It's like, I read this thing about Joseph Smith, or I read this thing about the book of Abraham. Oh my gosh, you're my loved one. I just want to share with you something that's really fundamental to what I've been learning and discovering. And then Allison is like, instead of like being there for you and wanting Andrew to, to understand you and to, to connect with you with that thing you want to share most, she's like angry and startled and defensive and, and fearful. You, you can't, it's really hard to build emotional intimacy when your worldviews are just totally diametrically opposed. Like literally not just different, yeah. but diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. And that's just a super hard dynamic to build emotional intimacy. So that's kind of the first thing. Now you guys were looking that's, at each other smiling. That's so I'm gonna, accurate. I'm going to make a second point, but what were you going to add to anything I said? Uh, it was just ringing true for me what you were saying. And you know what came to my mind is one... Uh, 
little anecdote that you shared with me, uh, shared with us, um, was the thought of being in a boat in the middle of the ocean. You got your whole family in the boat. I'm on one end, or it's like a canoe type thing, right? I'm on one end, Andrew's on the other, our kids are in the middle. There's a shark in the water. So Andrew's there, I'm here, the shark is actually the church. Andrew's standing up in the boat, yelling and screaming, there's a shark, there's a shark, there's a shark, it's gonna get our family, it's gonna kill us, he's freaking out. But in the midst of freaking out, he's got the boat rocking all over the place. So what do I do? I don't care about the shark. I'm not even going to look at the shark. All I'm doing is trying to keep the boat from not tipping over. Like I'm trying to keep my kids safe and all of us just in the boat. And so like, that's kind of, it's not the same thing as the worldview, but like his focus is somewhere totally else, somewhere else. I can't even look at that because I'm just trying to keep everyone safe and in the boat. And in the process, we're just floundering, missing each other and in a really precarious situation. And yeah. that really just like came up for me when you were sharing that. Yeah. So that, that, that's a really important dynamic. The second dynamic that I just wanted to note is that we all realized that Andrew was, was causing the backfire effect. He was freaking out, getting angry. Now, from Andrew's point of view, he's being super restrained because what he wants to do metaphorically is like mow the whole thing over, like destroy this, this entity that has been, you know, hijacking his life and causing all this pain and that isn't true and that isn't what it claims to be. So I think if he were just surrendering to his emotions, he'd go postal, right? Yeah. But, but in his mind, I'm not going to go postal. I'm going to totally like be as controlled and as careful and as thoughtful as I can, but I'm going to just share these things here and there because it's who I am and it's what I'm experiencing and I'm worried for my family. So from his perspective, he's being really restrained, but in, from, from the way she's experiencing it, it's, it's anger and it's bitterness and it's unrighteousness. And so that's an important perspective that even from Andrew's perspective, he was being restrained and diplomatic and even compassionate, even though Allison was still experiencing his anger. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Same set of facts, two totally different interpretations. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the, the final rub that I just want to make is an analysis of this scenario is Andrew decides the right course of action, which is I'm going to stop talking about it. I'm going to pack it down, right? I'm just going to go find either other friends or ways to cope with and deal with all this anger and frustration and sadness. But I realize I'm wrecking my marriage if I don't just clam up. That's actually the right answer from the perspective of giving the marriage a chance to heal. Okay? So that's good to stop talking about it, to stop poking and prodding, to stop being angry, to stop trying to put pressure. Because as soon as you sit back down in the canoe and you're no longer shaking it and you're sitting there low and calm and just collected, then Allison's going to be able to let go of the canoe. She's going to be able to sort of get out of her fight or flight mode, look around, and she's going to be able to actually start feeling comfortable and safe enough to do her own analysis and, and to figure out who she is, where the marriage is, and where she wants to be. So the rub is, Andrew, you made the right move there, but we all know that packing and stuffing psychologically is damaging. Mm -hmm. And learning to find external sources of emotional intimacy in a marriage is also damaging because mm -hmm. if, if he turns to another woman, if he turns to other friends, all of a sudden he's wanting to be with them and they're who he connects with and they're just growing further and further apart. So it's good that you went silent, but it's not good for your mental health yeah. to pack and stuff yeah. and avoid. Uh -huh. And it's not good for your marriage to have you seeking other sources of intimacy. So it's but a perilous, it's a perilous point in the marriage, right? It was very perilous. And luckily it worked to our benefit and yeah. he didn't have to do that for very long. Yeah. So, how so, did, so what happened? <laughs> we had a couple of false peaks on our journey up to this point in the story, right? We had a couple of points at which if we felt we crested that hill, it would be, we'd be solid. And those turned out to be false peaks. Um, and we, we could go back and talk about them. We kind of already did. But at this point, I would say this is truly 
the point of rock bottom. This is truly the, 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 the hard journey, right? This is the point at which we, are, we have the tools, we have the understanding, and we have the clarity to make a decision, right? Everything up until this point was unpacking, 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 stripping away the layers, the guilt, the shame, all this stuff. And now we were faced looking at each other in calmness after that blowout saying, is this what we really want? And all I could do was just to offer my soul and offer my heart and tell her that I would do anything I could do physically to not blow it up, at least right then. And I just tried to be as um, calm, as reassuring. I tried to be as present as possible. I would come home from work early. I would take extra rotations on the, on the shuttle driving, on the dishes. I would do whatever I could just to let her know I was here. And, and I think that calmed the, the explosiveness of that really difficult episode. And then, and then Allison, unbeknownst to me, really started digging deep and having her own independent experience that was separate from our relationship. And let, let me just add that. Uh, just a quick question to lead into that. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned you mentioned coming to me for a session or two. Yeah, I don't bring this up to be self serving, mm-hmm. but just like I asked you, what about your other therapy experiences was helpful? Mm-hmm. What what was it about our interactions in those sessions that, that was pivotal for you guys? And specifically for you both, what did you take from that that led to some real change, some positive change? Again, not to be self-serving, but just to let people know what helps them move the needle. So what? who wants to start on what was helpful about that? It was Im- immensely helpful for me. And at that point, when I called you through our, our, our mutual friend, um, what up, TS? I, I was at rock bottom because I thought my marriage was, was likely going to end. And, and I had built up an enormous amount of uh, trust and, uh, for your wisdom and your judgment. And I knew that there was this massive chasm between us and that very few people understood that chasm better than you. And I felt compelled and inspired to reach out. And you graciously... Uh, it was four sessions, and they were two-hour sessions. And I just felt like more than anything, you helped bridge a chasm. You helped bring us back together where we had been trying to connect for, for so long and in so many ways that I just felt like you, the first, I remember the first many minutes, maybe hour, it was you really showing Allison you not only understood but honored her path at a deep, sincere level. You pave the way to connect with her heart. And that to me was a huge turning point, you know, because without that, I don't know that she would have been open um, to having the kind of conversation that needed to happen especially with an apostate. Because I, I have to be honest, at this point, I was not a John DeLynn fan. <laughs> <laughs> and if that would have been brought up sooner as a place to go for counseling, I probably would have been pretty resistant because I had a lot of uh, pent-up animosity and anger about the thousands of hours he spent listening to your podcast that I was so frustrated with. <laughs> so I, I was at such a desperate place place that I'm like, I will go to anyone and anything. And if Andrew can relate to him and this may somehow help, I am there. But it, um, but what Andrew said is accurate. And as soon as we started talking, like there was just, you, you just saw our situation so clearly and Mm -hmm. everything you said, it was just, Mm -hmm. it just resonated. The, everything just like clicked and, um, it just took us to a different place than we had been before. Mm-hmm. I think it allowed us, having that conversation with you allowed us to again be reminded to de-emphasize the differences, to de-emphasize the church, to look at each other for who we actually are and really yeah. focus on the fundamentals. And that calmness and stillness, I think, you know, allowed Allison to, to eventually deal with all the stuff that had been building inside her that was heretofore unresolved. And some of the things just rang so true. Like when you shared that story that I just shared about the boat and the shark, like it was just like, 
oh yeah. Like there was just a few of those where you just gave these situations where I'm like, that's it. Like you just put your thumb on it. Like there was just a lot of clarity there that it was really helpful. Mm -hmm. So, um, so who made the changes then after kind of those sessions or two? Andrew, it sounds like you got softer, you backed off. Mm -hmm. How, how did your transformation like right happen? right when my transformation started to happen. and Was it because you felt safe? You felt safe enough to start exploring because you were no longer being threatened and attacked and assaulted or not? They kind of happen, happen simultaneously, if I'm honest. I don't think it's because he let off. I think that started before that happened, but luckily they coincided. And as soon as I started to have have that change start to happen was when he was softening up and I desperately needed that. Um, I needed that space. And I, I think that that day when I asked him to move out was kind of pivotal because I realized at that point when I said that, that I was, I was literally having to make the decision between choosing my husband or choosing the church. And I knew I had to make that decision and that's what it came down to. And at that point, I realized, um, this is kind of a complicated, I kind of have a hard time even making sense of what happened, if I'm honest. I just... Because um, you, were, you were like, weren't you callings in the church, like super orthodox? Like Yeah, I was in the Relief Society Presidency. State, I was State, State, State Relief, Relief Society, Society Presidency, Presidency, Young Women Presidency. I mean, like, no, I was teaching Relief Society. I was very, very... Yeah, very involved. Um, but I think what happened is I just hit this point of such utter desperation, and I, all of a sudden, I felt like I couldn't trust any information I was given. The mental gymnastics was so great of what I was being fed from church, what I was being fed from leaders of the church, what I was being fed from... Andrew, what I was getting, I couldn't even listen to myself if I would pray. I couldn't trust anything. Like everything just became a blur. I'll give you one example that like there was so much fear and anxiety wrapped around this decision and I was so confused. Um, one example of this is I, the stake president asked me to come in and he wanted to meet with me. This is um, after I resigned. And, and I was a little nervous about it. And you know, I went in and initially it started out really nice, like, you know, just thinking about you, wondering how you're doing. I know your husband left the church, you know, the whole, you know, my mom was a single mom and she raised these kids. She raised us and you can do it. You can do it. Basically, he's telling me I can be a single mom and I can raise the kids in the church and do it all without my husband. And like, this is supposed to make me feel better. <laughs> but it started out really from a caring place. At least that's what it felt like. But by the end, um, it started to go south and kind of derail as it continued on. He just kept talking and talking, and all of a sudden it turned into this really fear-based um, situation where, like, he gave me the story from in the Book of Mormon about Lee Haunty up on the mount and a Malachi trying to convince him to come down and... He wouldn't, he wouldn't come down, and he stayed up there, and then he keeps asking him, and he wouldn't come down, and then finally, he did come down, and, you know, Malachi ends up poisoning him in that whole situation where he fell for it, and he basically told me, he said, you've got to stay up on that mount, and when your husband tries to get you to do things you shouldn't do, or he wants to take you to a bar, or he's doing something he shouldn't do, you don't come down. You stay up there. You can do this on your own. I had bishops tell me that all my covenants are still intact. My kids are mine. Everything's safe and it'll all work out, but it's all without my husband. And then there was, you know, your husband's leading other men in the stake out of the church. And, oh, I bet he's super successful because he thinks marijuana is going to go wreck and he's going to make all this money. And all of a sudden it went really south of creating all this crazy fear about my husband and being petrified of, he's going to lead me away, I have to be so careful, I have to be careful of my husband and keep my distance, that, I mean, I'm getting all these mixed messages everywhere I go, trying to make me feel better, but now I don't even feel safe at church, because I'm this new project family, because I'm now a part member family, and 
oh, you're so good and righteous, you'll be fine, but then it makes me feel so unsafe at home. I'm getting all these mixed messages and it got to the point where I just mentally like checked out and I made this decision that I am not going to trust or listen to anybody but myself, period. I am going to let every belief I have ever thought was true, I'm wiping it clean. I'm like a new baby. I am born and I believe nothing because I can't trust anything. And if, and if the church is true, then it's going to rise up and just be true. But I'm going to challenge everything and I'm just going to take what feels good and true and I'm going to keep it. And if it doesn't feel true or good, I am letting it go because I can't do anything else but that. And I had given my voice up to outside authority for my whole entire life that I think I had become so disconnected that I could not even tell what I thought was accurate. And that's when I got scared because I couldn't even trust myself. I couldn't trust anything. So I said, no, I'm cutting everyone off. I'm not listening to anyone but me. Because you had allowed yourself to be fooled. So yes. how do you even trust yourself, right? Exactly. Yeah. I didn't know how to believe anything. So I said, I'm wiping it all clean. And I'm going to preface this with that last year when this leading up to this, I went to the temple every week. I read the Book of Mormon three times that year. I was serving the church. I did everything above, beyond. I was on my knees praying three to four times a day and not casual prayers, like sobbing 20, 30 minute prayers. I was praying in the car while I was driving. I mean, I was so consumed in this that it was like, I can't mentally carry living like this anymore. Like I'm letting everything go and I'm just starting from scratch. And that is when like everything changed. I went to the temple and I sat there and I said, how do I feel when I'm here? I went to church and I sat there. How do I feel when I'm here? I listened to one of your podcasts because I decided... How did John get from true believing to where he is now? I need to see his pro I need to see his path. And do I trust his voice and what did he what he went through? And I started listening to little things. And I would allow myself just to think about it and see if it were it felt right cuz I would not look at them before. I tried to figure out how I felt when I prayed. All these separate things and I'd keep things that I thought were true and I'd let things go that were not true. And one thing that was really pivotal, pivotal at this time is I started to read in Sacred Loneliness and really looking into polygamy and into Joseph Smith. And I was doing both of these things simultaneously, the church things and this. And I literally, there was like a two to three day period. I don't know how long or what happened, but I literally woke up one day and you've given this analogy before, but it was like I had been living my whole life in black and white. And I woke up one day and my life was in color. And my whole worldview had just changed. It was like a light switch went off in my head. I did not make it happen. I did not want it to happen. I don't know how this occurred, but literally something just flipped. And it became clear as day. Clear as day the church was not true. I literally knew it and like more so than I knew all that time that I thought the church was true. But the weird thing was, is I knew it came from my own voice and my own heart and my own head. And I kept studying. I didn't just let it go at that. Like I kept studying. I was reading books, listening to podcasts, really studying these issues deeply. But then when I was feeling lied to and that the prophets now, like I'd learn these things and I'd get on and actually look at the church his, the essays online and I'm seeing them leave out all these things on polygamy and giving a whitewashed version of what went on. And I just felt this deep betrayal. Like I listened to your authority. I gave my life to your authority. I am trusting you and you will not be honest with me. You are lying to me. You will not be honest. And it was so devastating to realize that I had been so lied to, that they're not truthful, that none of this stuff was true. 
that I have given everything to. And I recognize that in Joseph Smith and all that polygamy and all the, the things they did to women and the voices of women and the whole feminist side, all these things became so real. And all of a sudden, these parts of my life just popped open and I saw how I had been held back in these different ways, how my mindset, how my life choices had been so dramatically affected being a woman in the church and not listening to my voice and bowing down to authority and not listening to myself, how it had totally affected and shaped who I was. And it was, it was the craziest experience. I mean, you talk about like, you know, dark night of the soul, hum, like from a human developmental perspective, all these different things happening. It was like, I literally became another person overnight and I don't know how that happened, but it was like the light switch went off and I, I live in a totally different world. And it's like, I see so clearly and I trust myself. And when I trust myself, like I'm finding truth and good things happening, I for the first time in my life, I could see Andrew. I had never seen my husband before. I'd never seen him. And for the first time, I saw him. I saw his heart. I could look at him honestly and see him for who he was, not who I had concocted, not who the church had concocted, not who my parents had concocted, not who everyone had. I saw his heart. And all these things just changed. Everything changed. And I started like this year-long process or longer. It's been longer than that now, but it's just going quiet, taking time, listening to myself, studying. And one of the biggest fears and things that changed was what happened to that spiritual connection? What happened to me talking to God? What happened to all those answers? What happened to what was me? Because when that happened, everything went silent. Everything just went, everything just stopped 100%. And I got super freaked out. Like, does this mean this isn't that I'm wrong? I don't know, but I, but I felt this clarity to just sit in that space and I was okay with it. I'd question it, but I was okay with it because I realized I could hear myself and I felt calm and I felt peaceful and I felt happier than I had ever been in my entire life life. And I felt supported. And I just decided I'm staying here. I'm not going back. And as this time has progressed and I, I'm not atheist. I don't know what I am. I'm not, I'm not, all I know is there is a divinity in each one of us that we can tap into. And all that guidance I received and all those answers to prayers and all that support and love and things that carried me through my mission and my marriage, that was in me all along. There is something else going on. There was an additional force. I was receiving help in some way, but in no way is that that God that Joseph Smith saw or didn't see or whatever. But I found this inner voice and there's just this inner divinity that each one of us has. And I think that's that spirituality is when you can tap into yourself you can find that voice and listen to it and trust it. The clarity that comes, it's like I just live in this stillness now. And things get crazy and rocky, but I can go back to that point of like stillness and peace. And I'm learning to trust my voice and to trust my intuition. And the church, everything just changed. And it all just disappeared. And that's where all the healing started. I have to ask, and this is really powerful, some of the most powerful minutes in the history of Mormon stories as far as I'm concerned, uh, beautiful stuff. Can you look back now and correlate your low-grade depression for decades and the disconnect you had from yourself and the way that you had sort of outsourced authority to other people. I don't want to project nope. that onto you, nope. but I just want to know if you see a connection there. 100%. Talk, talk about that. 100%. Like that's what was going on. It was like, 
in order to believe in the, the church and to live all of its teachings perfectly and to fully believe, because I did, I literally did, and it sustained me. I wasn't looking to get out of it. I loved it. I wanted to be in, and I wanted to believe it. And so to have this be the result was shocking to me. I was not trying to disprove it. I wanted to stay there. I was getting pushed out of my comfort zone. But all of a sudden, the light switch came on. And it was like, this is what was keeping me from hearing myself. I wouldn't trust it. If those feelings, anytime they came up, where I would question authority, where I would question anything, it would clamp it down and it would keep me in this depression. It fueled my depression. 100%. And it, it kind of blows my mind. I still try to sort some of that out, but it played into all the aspects of the different times in my life where I struggled with depression. It was from a loss of not hearing my own voice and bowing to authority. And what's funny is you have a fear of trusting yourself that if you don't have this authority telling what you what you're gonna do, you're gonna ruin your life. People are telling me, you leave the church, your kids, your, your kid, you can't raise your kids outside of the church. They're going to be ruined. They're not safe. You can't do it. You need all these people telling you what to do. This is the only safe community and tribe to raise your children in. It's the only safe place for you to be in. Your husband's going to leave you. You're going to start drinking. You're going to, your marriage is going to fall apart. You're not going to be happy. All these lies that I had totally bought into and believed because living those things had kept me very safe, right? I didn't experience a lot of that, but I didn't experience myself. I didn't experience life. I didn't trust myself. And all of a sudden, like my relationships are a hundred percent deeper. I am completely connected to my husband, my kids. I am free to love them 100% as they are. There is not a single, um, there is nothing that, that prevents me from doing that. I don't care if they serve a mission. I don't care what they, they could do anything. I love them unconditionally. There are no conditions to my love to anybody, to any person I see on the street. To anyone who's different from me, I see every stranger when I'm checking out at the grocery store. Like, I can love that lady that's checking me out. We're totally different, but like now we're totally the same. Before, I just lived in this shell where I was disconnected from everyone because I was better, I was safer, I was in this great spot, and everyone else was the other. And all of a sudden, the other just evaporated, and I became like one with everybody. And it's like so, I don't know, it's just so freeing and healing. And I, I just wish everyone could like tap into themselves and trust themselves and find that like inner divinity and voice within you. And it's all okay. It's all good. Everyone has it. I can still have those experiences. Not people, to, the Holy Ghost, people in the church are not the only ones who have access to the Holy Ghost or whatever you want to call it. Everyone has access to divinity, spirituality, whatever it is, and it is in you, and you can find it on your own. You don't have to outsource it. You can't outsource it. Ooh. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, but I'm just going to, I'm going to acknowledge that there are people, little time out, there are people who find deep joy and meaning and fulfillment in religion. So my point is not that, you know, Allison's experience is everyone's and that religious people are all dumb and fooled. That is not actually what I hope is getting communicated here. Because I think that there are people that can find religion and religion makes them feel as awesome as now Allison is feeling. But for Allison, what we just heard is that there was the system that was simultaneously telling her, you can't be well without us. And it was making her sick. <laughs> and for her, 
it was actually unplugging from the system that had told her she can't be happy and healthy without the system. It was the act, very act of unplugging from that system and connecting with herself where she healed and became her best self. And that's just a really ironic kind of scenario. I don't think they're like evil people at the church saying, let's make people sick and let's make them dependent on us. No. Right? No, I'm not trying to, yeah. to say no, that no, at all. No, like I, and I'm not trying to put down people's spirituality because when I hear that, I can relate to it because I found that within the Mormon church. That fed me for many years, and I actually think that helped pave the way for what has occurred because spirituality has always been important to me, feeling that connection, and, and there's something to be said for that, right? But it's just... I. This has just been my experience. Yeah, it's your experience. It's mine, and I'm not... But that's important. Yeah. You went decades with low-grade or severe depression when, um, when it, was, it was needing to disconnect and connect with yourself that mm -hmm. was going to be the solution. And Somebody, it was scary to do that. It yeah. was scary to give yourself permission to do that because you're not allowed to do that. Yeah, yeah. There's so many comments. I'm just going to share a few because people are really resonating with what you're saying, Allison. Daniel wrote the quote, I don't know what I am. I just know that there's divinity in all of us. And that's something yeah. you said. Sean says, wow, Allison, thanks for sharing and articulating your experiences so clearly. Tammy says, so beautifully said, me too. Um, Tim and Alyssa write, once you see the light, you can't go back to the darkness. It's so freeing. Um, Jenea writes, Allison, you are speaking my truths. Thank you for sharing this with love in the way uh, that you are. Um, uh, Carrie writes, there's a reason that Prozac is the candy of choice in Utah. And we're going to talk about uh, medicine uh, in the next episode. <clears throat> but my guess is you're not the only person in Mormonism yeah. that has been disconnected from themselves. And because they were systematically disconnected from themselves, they felt like they needed some sort of medicine to numb or to medicate the pain of being disconnected from oneself, right? Yeah. And that's where the pharmaceutical companies, Big Pharma is very willing to step up and say, here's a pill, here's a pill to make you feel better when really what you need is self-connection. Yeah. Right? And during that time I had taken Prozac for a year up until that point and I knew I was starting to, it was starting to not settle well. I was falling. I couldn't stay awake. I couldn't focus. I was struggling. And it was about that time and maybe a month before I decided to go off and I had weaned him, I had stopped taking it and I knew it was time to get off. And it kind of happened simultaneously with this as well that I got myself off of that. And, and I just knew I, I had to stop and get my body clean and do something different. And Andrew, I want to bring you in, but I'm just gonna read a couple more things. Lisa writes, this is my story too. Although I don't doubt my story and new truths, it feels so good to be validated. Thank you for sharing this. Ruth, uh, we'll bring Ruth's question in later. Heather, who I met last night, and we had fun, Heather, last night. She says, you speak so much truth to me. I love your voice, Allison. Um, and Chelsea writes, Allison for president. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I have to thank you for all those comments. That feels really good. It was scary to come on here and to speak this. But I just hope that if it can help someone or if someone's struggling or feeling anything close to what I did. I just want there to be hope and there's answers and for people to really love themselves and to trust themselves. Because it's so, oh, life is, can be so, so good. You don't have to stay in that spot. And Life is so good. Like, I have my dream of marriage. I have it. It was always there under my nose. And I just feel so grateful that I stuck it out and that I held on and kept going and that he fought and he developed and he had his own process. And I had mine and we were able to find each other and see each other. Because I could not be happier. Andrew, I want to ask how you're feeling now, but what was it like 
to see her make this transformation? What was it like for you after years and years of self-doubt, of shaming, of, of anger, of stuffing, of venting, of pain? Talk about what that was like for you. I don't know that I'll be able to, to be honest. I'll try. <laughs> it's hard. It's still pretty fresh. But it's joyful, and it feels beautiful and amazing to hear her say what she just said. It's so inspirational for me. And selfishly, I just would rather end the interview now and just be done and bask in what she just said. <laughs> really? It was that good? For yeah, sure. for me. For, for me. sure, me but, too. But I want to answer your question. You know, it's ironic that that Sushi Fever is the restaurant where we had this big blow up where I lost my shit about our summer It was Honey schedule. Salt. It was. Oh, dang it. it sushi was Fever be... was the good conversation. You're right. Yeah, that was Honey Salt. Oh, I totally remember that now. Yeah. So forget that point. We were at dinner, Sushi Fever this time, got that right. And I knew something had been changing, right? I knew we were in this silence period about the church. We were taking care of each other. We were being relatively still, no conversations about the Let church. me say one thing. When yeah. this was going on, I did not talk to Andrew about any of it. No. We went silent. He stopped pushing me. Yeah. I asked him no questions about the church. Yeah. I didn't want to tell him what I was doing because I was doing my own research. I did not want his influence. I do not want anyone to ever say that I left the church because of my husband. Mm -hmm. That is so hurtful to me that insulting, someone yeah. so insulting that someone would think that I would do that, that I was, this was my own process mm -hmm. and I did it on my own and I just needed that space to not have that happen. And that's when he got quiet and gave me that time to let me knew, let me do it. And I, I'm really grateful that he was able to step back because he must have been really curious and wondering what in the world was going on, but he stepped back and he gave me the space. Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah, continue. No, no, that's a great point. And, and we were at Sushi Fever. It was a few weeks into this exploration that she was doing completely on her own, unbeknownst to me. And I just said, Al, there's something different. Like, what's going on? You're acting different. There's a, there's a, there's a calm, there's a stillness at home and with each other that, you know, has been a stark contrast to how things have been the last few months. And it was then that she told me that she had, she was forgetting everything she believed and rebuilding her entire belief system from scratch. And I got super emotional at that moment because I knew what it meant. And I didn't know what it meant in terms of engagement with the church, but I knew or I wanted to believe, I knew what it meant for her soul and for her happiness and for her peace. And I had experienced a lot of that um, by this time myself. And I was incredibly excited and that gave, it reinvigorated me. And so over the course of the next couple months, it was deep conversation. It was three, four, six hour long conversations. It yeah. was bonding, it was healing, it was connection. It was making up for lost time. And there was no judgment. And, and at that time, she hadn't even reached a conclusion about the church yet, I, 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 at least you, that you told me. I mean, I kind of felt I, that you were open and you were I had, but I wasn't ready to say it out loud. You weren't ready to say it, yeah. And so for me, it opened up this beautiful, blissful period where we could talk to each other and love each other and share everything with each other without even getting into our actual beliefs. It was a conversation that had been missing from our marriage for so long, and it just felt fulfilling. And I said many times in that period, you know, if you end up concluding that the church is right for you and right for the kids, I'm at peace with that. I'm okay with that. You know, I need to get work through this anger I have. I need to forgive the church. I need to get past that and see the beauty and not just the damage. And so that in and of itself was a beautiful healing period that we went through, but it was only a couple of months. And then things happened really fast. It, it yeah. went pretty high speed when it happened. And then she ultimately said, look, I, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. 
I mean, this whole thing, the fight, move out, John DeLynn, rebuild everything from scratch at 43 years of age to not just I'm done F.U. Mormonism. It was the calmest, quietest, maturest, love-filled decision that was after an immense amount of turmoil. And I knew what it meant for us. And it was um, invigorating and beautiful and uplifting and peaceful. And before, before we told any, shared any of this with our kids, they started making comments like, what's going on? <laughs> Things are different. <laughs> My mom said that. I went, what's going on with Allison? She said, there was a palpable difference in our relationships that was just incredibly healing. And, you know, if I hadn't lived it, I would probably dismiss it a little bit. Probably like, yay, hey, they're rehashing history, telling a favorable kind of view of story, a story tale version of it. That's exactly how it happened and unfolded. And it was just this stillness and calmness and we, where we had turned away from each other for so many years when we came together and really faced each other and let all the bullshit aside. We finally saw each other for the first time ever and it was, it was beautiful. And fortunately, we both loved what we saw and it was um, magical. And, and the beautiful thing is it's only gotten better in the over year since that happened. Yeah. And it's rubbed off on our friendships with our children, with our relationships. There are people who may be confused about what we've gone through, but no one can doubt our love for them. And it has been um, incredibly fulfilling and gratifying. And I just can't believe that we both had such massive changes of heart that allowed us to get to this point. And I feel very blessed and fortunate. And um, you know, just to hear her say the words that she just said just means everything to me. Um, we have about eight minutes before 1.15, okay. and so we're, we're going to be wrapping up with okay. Allison's portion, and then Allison's going to bolt, and we're going to talk about the cannabis marijuana uh, business and how that happened as our final sort of episode. But um, uh, one of our listeners, Ruth, writes something really important. She writes, I still feel that I need to put my kids into a church because of that fear. Do you have something spiritual in your life now? And what are your thoughts about needing a church to raise happy, healthy kids? Allison, why don't you go first? Um, you know what? I am working on that. I don't feel like I need a church to raise my kids. I don't want to be a part of any other religion. I don't, I don't need that. I know that I am capable of doing it. I believe I am partly because I have so much trust and faith in my kids. Um, and the conversations that we can have now are so open and honest, where before there were all these conditions to the conversation, they were only allowed to really answer in one way. There was only one correct answer. And now there's so many that I'm finding so much like joy and discovery in just talking about all these things with them. And I'm just seeing their goodness and their abilities come forward and I'm blown away with their capacity for good and knowing what's right. I'm really wanting to teach them to listen to their own voice. Um, one thing that's helped me tremendously is meditation. That has become a daily practice. Is that I'm, something Thomas McConkie helped you with or were there other Yeah, sources? introduced. I've been doing some, um, I've been doing a lot of studying, a lot of, I'm involved in a um, anyway, it's human development. I've been studying a lot of things, but I started a meditation teacher training course, and that has been uh, a lifeline for me. It is such a great tool to find peace and clarity. To that's that's been a, a gift. So I highly, highly recommend um, using that. But I I don't have any intention or desire to 
you need another religious community. I think there are other outlets and other ways of doing it, but that's just for me. That's just for my family. I think it's different for everyone. And we're working on that. We're ironing. I have not mastered that. We're still trying to figure out ways to make sure we're giving our kids enough. It's hard when on a week to week basis, they're being taught honesty and gratitude, all, all these type of things that I still want to teach them. But I, we have good friends. We're meeting different communities where they can be around people who think um, like-minded and live good moral lives, and they recognize it. My take on that is community is great. Dogma is where I find the challenge in, a, yeah. in, in, a, in any religion, or it doesn't even necessarily have to be a religion, just dogma, the idea that somebody has exclusive truth or the one right path to me is very dangerous and inhumane. Community is great, and to the extent that a church or any organization can provide a healthy community, you know, kids need that, we need that. We're very social beings, and so I think that's, that's a personal decision that you have to make, but for us, we haven't felt compelled or drawn to a, a particular religion, um, but I do see the value in community if it's done properly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Really quickly, Daniel asks a really good question. Have the believing family and friends that have watched you through this transition, are they, how affirming are they, number one, as to how happier you seem and how positive this path has been for you? Do you, are you able to get validation? Is it fair to expect validation from your believing family and friends about the path you've chosen? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> Mixed reviews there, right? I have felt a lot of validation from um, Andrew's side of the family. I have not gotten any, let's just say I've not had any um, negative, I haven't people, I have not had people tell me negative things. M my family doesn't like to discuss it. We just don't talk about it. They know, but it's not discussed. So whether they see a difference or not, I have no idea. We don't spend enough time together or talk about these things enough for me to know if they recognize a change. Um, but I do have a lot of people comment that I do seem happier. Even people that I don't know very well, I mm -hmm. do get a lot of comments that mm -hmm. way. So I would have to say it is more positive. And maybe I'm just so much happier. That's just my interpretation of it. I don't know. Yeah, I think the whole idea of needing or wanting or seeking or even being attuned to others' perceptions has really gone down. And, and, and to give the community credit, I think for the most part, the people who have said things, who have voiced their opinion or commented have all been positive. There's a, there's a, there's a silence there that is not positive. And there have been some interactions with our kids and, you know, seminary teachers and others who have, you know, kind of, made judgments and assumptions that haven't been helpful. But overall, I would say it's been fairly positive. Everyone's been very great. Mm -hmm. The My only observation that's been hard is there's just a silence. Mm -hmm. This awkward silence. There's just a silence. <laughs> no one asks. No one says anything. Everyone just pretends like everything's exactly how it always has been. Yeah. I've never talked about this with any of them. Yeah. My believing friends. This is our coming out, John. <laughs> well... So many people think this, my parents love me, my yeah. siblings love me, uh, my ward community loves me, they respect me, they know I'm a good, honest person. So of course, when I make a change around something so fundamental, they are going to want to know why, they're going to want to understand it, they're going to want to learn. Well, they're so smart and honest that if they found something that's important, I want to learn that too. And so we all kind of expect that that's what yes. me, love means. Go no. ahead. Let me say this, because as you say this, no one is asking any of it. They stay quiet. They don't want to know. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know. Mm -hmm. But they are just as loving towards us. And I was really nervous about that, like judgment or lack of respect or losing that, that they were going to think I was crazy or I don't feel that. I still feel that they see my heart and that I see their hearts. Like I still love them and I think they still love me. I really do. They might question or wonder what I'm doing, but it's been okay. 
I was more scared. And when I let it happen, it ended up being more positive than I anticipated. And my parents, even though they don't understand or even know what I believe, they just love me. Mm, they're beautiful people. And they're, that's what, you know, they're mm -hmm. trying their hardest. Yeah. And yeah. I have to recognize that goodness in people. Allison, we don't want to make have you miss yeah. your flight, so this will be I your last go. question for you. Okay. And then Andrew, we'll finish up this episode together, okay. and then we'll keep going. Is that okay? Great. Do you guys want to kiss and say goodbye now? I say, definitely want to okay. kiss okay. her right <laughs> now. Wait, I'll, 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 after I will that. as I'm leaving. Okay, so Allison, she's running off to Seattle. Last thing, um, for all the security you had before, for the support in raising your kids, for the church community, and for all the relationships that you had that were faithful and devout that have now been compromised in some way because of your change in beliefs, the yeah. distance that's grown for all the cost that you've incurred from experiencing this change. Has it been overall worth it? And if so, why that'll be your final. It has question. been 100% worth it. I have never been happier in my whole life. I have never been more at peace with myself. I have never experienced more healing, more insight, more understanding. I've never felt closer to my husband, to my children, to um, there was no cost. Even if you're estranged from maybe family a little more than you might have been? Not at the end of the day, because I don't believe it would stay that way. Because there's so much goodness that has been found and is out there. There's still healing going on. This hasn't all been like flowers and rainbows. Like, it's been hard. This has been a process. I've had to work through a lot of stuff. And there's still things I'm working through. But at the end of the day, it's totally worth it. Because relationships are deepening. And the ones that might have been a little damaged, I'm actually experiencing like, breakthroughs of I'm going to get to know them in a different way and it's going to change and the relationships that have mattered have deepened and strengthened and I've made new ones that have been so much more fulfilling than ones I had before that I would never trade it or go back ever Allison Jolly, you're amazing we love you we're so grateful for your everything you shared this is these segments are going to save marriages. They're going to save lives. They're going to bless the lives of tens of thousands of people. You guys kiss Thanks, and say John. goodbye to each other on camera because we got to continue, but you got to go. All right. So go All ahead. Right, have fun. <laughs> Love you. I love you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Okay.